This is Dan, and this is the Napkin Academy. Today I want to talk about the tale of two journeys. The first one is, there really is an easy way to make a great presentation. Surprise to many people who don't like giving presentations. And simple idea number two is there is a way for you to write your book and get it published. So we're going to talk about both those journeys today. I want to start with the journey of the presenter. So let's say that this is us over here and we've got a great idea about something and we've got an audience of people over here with whom we'd like to share that idea. So what I want to talk about is the journey we take to make sure our idea becomes as wonderful as it can so that these people are excited to listen to it. I'm working on a new book. It's called Show and Tell How Everybody Can Make Extraordinary Presentations. Uh, it will be published by Penguin in 2014. Expected pub date in the United States will be in March, rolling out in multiple languages and around the world following that. So what I wanted to share with you today were just some of the really core thoughts about what this book is about. And I think the basic idea is this. All of us increasingly find ourselves in a position where we need to make presentations. And sometimes our presentations are great and sometimes they're not that great. But I think in the end, as presenters, our real goal is something that's very simple. It's to help other people see the say things that we see. Now, that's a pretty simple goal. All we really want to do is, let's say that this is us, and here's our idea, the thing that we want to share. We want to share it in such a way that this audience out here is as interested in looking at that idea as we have been. And in order to do that, we do some entertainment, we do some education, some persuasion, some motivation, and we try to help our audience make some kind of a change. Now, that should be pretty easy, but it's not. And I think the question that I want to try to work on in the book Show and Tell is, if presenting is so easy to do, how come it's not easy at all? And the reason we know it's not very easy is because, truthfully, I think many of us would, would admit that the presentations we make are not as great as we'd like them to be. They often just kind of lie flat. There's us with our idea. We show it to people. and. People are checking their text messages. Maybe somebody falls asleep. Somebody gets it. Someone's upset. And I find that kind of interesting because it seems to me that every time one of us shares an idea with someone else, that ought to be a pretty memorable experience. All of our presentations should be pretty extraordinary. So here's the question. Why is it that it's hard? And I think the answer is because this, from us to a happy audience, is not a straight line. The reason it's not a straight line is I think that there are three mountains, three big bumps that get in the way. And one of those is fear, and one of those is confusion, and one of those is boredom. And I think that these are real. And the way I often think of these is the three peaks of presentation doom. These are the very things that make it hard to be a great presenter. The three peaks, they're big, they're real, and they stand directly between us and our audience. If we're going to have a successful presentation one way or another, we've got to scale through or around these three big peaks to reach our goal. The good news is there are three simple ways to get past these peaks. We can get rid of the fear through planning. And planning actually allows us to have a lot of fun in our presentation. I think that we can get past the confusion through effective preparation and in particular preparing a good storyline. And I think that we can get rid of boredom that our audience might suffer by performing a bit. And in order to perform we're going to do what we call a little bit of visual magic. Those are the three ways that we get across the peaks. This is something that I call the presenter's path. And this is what we're going to take to get from us to a very successful presentation. In order to counter fear, we're going to have fun. In order to counter confusion, we're going to make sure that things are absolutely clear. And in order to counter any boredom, we're going to make sure that we deliver a little bit of visual magic. That's what the book Show and Tell is really about. And it's broken up into three sections. One is the first peak. How do we deal with this issue of fear? 
it's generally considered assumed knowledge that at least here in the United States the number one fear that most people have is a fear of speaking in public one of the things that we need to understand is that fear is not necessarily a bad thing and I think that the way we get past this issue of fear stage fright presenters anxiety butterflies in the tummy is to channel our fear kind of like Aikido by knowing what the fear is although the fear is real that is to say we are evolutionarily adapted to be fearful of situations that put us in high stress and nothing puts us in higher stress than us being in front of a whole bunch of people that are just looking at us talk about a high stress situation and so our system has adapted to say in a case of high stress certain types of chemicals start to activate in my brain to speed me up so that I can either fight or run or perform and so what's interesting is recognizing the fear is there for a good reason the fear is not a bad thing it's trying to tell us do well and doing well is great because it makes us feel happy and it makes our audience happy so what we need to do is recognize that just on the other side of fear really is something called fun because if we can get past whatever concerns we have about public speaking there is nothing on earth that is more fun than standing on stage and sharing an idea with a group of people who are enjoying it and I will tell you I do probably close to 100 presentations per year those presentations run anywhere from 15 up to 6,000 people per presentation I'm talking about live presentations now and I will tell you that every single time I get up there in front of a new group I go through some moments of anxiety but now recognizing what they are and some tools we'll talk about it becomes the most fun thing that I've ever done and here's how number one if we're worried about public speaking remember this worry dissolves instantly on contact with planning if we're worried about something, oh no, all we need to do is begin to plan for it. We won't solve the problem, but the act of planning helps to counter those really scary chemicals and helps us get back on our feet and know that we will be able to be successful. How do we plan? Any presentation is composed of just three simple things. Us, our idea, and our audience. That's all there is. There's nothing else. What does that tell us when it comes to planning? I think of something called the three bucket plan. One plan is about my idea, one plan is about myself, and one plan is about my audience. Into my idea plan, I put everything I can think of about my idea. Into my self plan, I put the things I think about me. Who do I want to be when I give this presentation? Who am I really? And into my audience bucket, I throw everything I think I know or need to know about my audience who are they what motivates them what excites them and what I do then is I just start to make a plan from those three things for a while I'll work on my idea then I'll work a bit on my own how I want to present myself and then I'll work on some ideas I have about my audience that act alone putting the ideas into those buckets is the number one way to eliminate worry because we know that we're beginning to get on top of the things that scare us the other issue is panic if anybody's ever felt the panic of being on stage or of stage fright here is the number one rule to counter that practice panic always recedes with practice and the practice can be done in a very simple and very programmatic way there's something that we call the plugs out test it's actually taken from NASA <laughs> this is a test that they do on space flight before they send the rocket up into space they actually unplug it from the launch tower on earth and they test every system as if it was in space so that they know that everything works by the time they do get up into orbit so we do exactly the same thing a plugs out test simply tells us that when we're going to give a presentation we do not simply sit in the back of a room and imagine what it's going to be like in our mind we get into a place that looks exactly like where the presentation is going to take place and we go through the entire presentation line by line and it is very painful hopefully we'll have one person in the room to help encourage us but again the idea is the room is empty at this point but it is the actual room or very close to it and the first times terrible but then you know what we do we do it again and this time we're gonna find that it's not so hard at all what that tells us is then when it's time to actually make the presentation we are so totally ready to go because we've already been in this place we've already said these words now the only difference is we've got a live audience that's gonna help us 
make sure those words are coming out really well. And because we know them so well, now our confidence goes up and we can actually start to respond directly to that audience live. And we can start to improvise a bit because we have the confidence of knowing that we've practiced. Peak number two, big ideas are confusing and so it's our job as a presenter to be extraordinarily clear. So how do we do that? Well, one thing we recognize is that successful presentations are always built on clear storylines. A good presentation always has a single clear storyline. It has a beginning and it has an end and it moves in a very specific way all the way through. A presentation storyline is not endless. That's no good. It is not confusing. That's worse. And it is not random. That's the worst of all because then our audience doesn't think we know what we're talking about. Why is one of these storylines so important? Because a storyline is exactly what we need to tame confusion. Any idea that we're going to start with is very complicated and has lots of moving parts. So if we can force it through this kind of tube of the storyline, we guarantee that we force that confusion into submission long enough for it to be understood. I believe that of all the different kinds of presentations that are out there, whether they're team status meetings or financial updates or quarterly reports or class lectures or even a cooking show or an academic paper, a job interview, a commencement address, a sales pitch, a product launch, a TED talk, even a sermon, every one of those presentations can be made with just one of four storylines. It's either a report, it's an explanation, it's a pitch or it's a drama. Every presentation can be made with one of these four storylines. The first one is the report. Basically conveys the facts. Takes us from some knowledge to an increased level of knowledge about some piece of information. Typically pretty boring, frankly, but we can make them interesting. Storyline number two is the explanation that takes us from some level of knowledge or ability here to a higher level and it does that by taking us up step by step a series of steps so we have some sort of new knowledge by the time we're done. Storyline number three is the pitch. This is the one that gets us over some kind of hurdle or some problem. We start here and we say to someone look we know we've got a problem I've got a way to solve it listen to me join me do what I suggest and we'll get over that together. That's really the kind of the sales presentation and then the fourth storyline is the one I'm going to call the drama, which is really the one that resonates with us most emotionally. We start here at some particular level of happiness, and then bad things happen, and they take us down to a bad place. But we persevere, and we come back up, and guess what? On the other side, we've changed the way we think about the world because we went through this struggle and emerged stronger on the other side. So there you have it. Those are the four storylines. And in Show and Tell, I go through each one of them with examples and case studies of exactly how to build each one of the four. Which then brings us to the third peak, which is boredom. Let's face it, sitting in a room watching someone talk can be pretty boring. So as the presenter, what we do is we perform a little bit of magic. Here's what I mean. More of our mind is dedicated to vision than any other thing that we do. If this was kind of a loose schematic diagram of our brain, everything you see here in red, looking and seeing, looking and seeing, 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 looking and seeing, looking and seeing, seeing, looking and seeing. We could pretty much make the argument that by virtue of being human, we're essentially walking, talking, vision processing machines. One example is we could imagine we're a little character kind of with a camera on our head. We're looking at everything all day. We walk out in the morning and we see the sun and we see the clouds and we see the birds and we say, wow. What a gorgeous day. And then maybe we stop off at some point and our camera says, oh, look at that lovely butterfly or look at that, that flower there. Never saw that one before. And let's face it, there are certain things, certain shapes that distract us so much that our visual is pulled towards them is so great that we might step right into a pit without even paying attention. It means that our visual mind never sleeps. So when we're sitting there in a boring lecture hall and someone's up there with their PowerPoint reciting verbally their lines, our brain, our visual mind with nothing to do, will start to make up its own worlds. We'll zone off, we'll start to make up our own. So what is the job of the presenter? Always give our audience something to look at. And what do we give them to look at? We give them pictures. Those could be photographs. Those could be charts. Those could be drawings. 
They could be sketches. They could be diagrams. They could be schematics. We give our audience pictures. Those pictures align with the story that we told and we can keep an audience activated for as long as it takes us to tell the story. And which pictures would we create? Well, this is where the book ties back to our previous work and everything on the Napkin Academy we've already studied. Because the pictures we'll make for our presentation are exactly the same pictures that we're going to take from our 6x6 six six rule. Our portrait that answers who and what, our chart that answers how much, our map that answers where, our timeline that answers when, our flowchart that answers how, and our equation that answers why. So if we need to give a presentation and we want to know which pictures would we show, we start here and we draw. And we figure out who is in our presentation and we draw or find a photo of them. How much are we talking about? We make a chart. We make our way all the way around and this little simple 6x6 six six model will generate for us every single picture we'll ever need for any presentation we'll ever need to make. Which concludes the presenter's journey and my little presentation for you this morning about uh, show and tell. And what I wanted to do now quickly is go into a second journey, a very fast one, a very personal journey, the journey of the author. How can we go from having an idea to actually having a book? It can be done. And let me show you my experience because I think this can apply to everyone. So imagine it's something like this. One fine day, we're sitting in our office and we're working, and in the front of our mind, up here, are all our thoughts about work and whatever we're doing as we're tapping away. But in the back of our mind, there's some other idea, something else that we're very interested in, and we're keeping it in the back of our mind. But then, perhaps, something occurs where the idea that was in the back of our mind flips to the front of our mind, and we suddenly say, wait a minute, this thing that I've been working on isn't as interesting as this other idea that I have in my mind. Maybe I should spend some time thinking about that. Oh, and now we're in real trouble, because now all of a sudden the fun and the fear start to kick around in our mind while we say, wait a minute, I could continue to do this work, and I probably should because I still need to earn my money, but at the same time, what would happen if I let this other idea, this thing I'm really interested in, start to percolate too? Ah, and now we have the beginning of a book. The next thing we need to do at least for a non-fiction, <laughs> a non-fiction book, which is the only kind I've done, so everything we're talking about here is non-fiction, is we let that idea roll around long enough until we can create a proposal. Ha! Here's my idea. Here's what it's about. We type up that proposal. Maybe we include some pictures along with our words. We package that proposal up, and now comes the big step. What we do is we need to find an agent. A publisher will not talk to you unless you have an agent. Imagine that you're uh, Tom Cruise or George Clooney or Katy Perry. No movie maker is going to talk directly to you unless you have an agent because that's just the way the system works. How do you find an agent? Well, you go online and you look for one. Look for one who comes highly recommended and you give your proposal to the agent. You will go back and forth with the agent until eventually the agent hopefully says, yes, your proposal now is great, and it did require back and forth. Your agent is your friend. Because what the agent then does, having helped you create the proposal, is the agent takes it to the publisher. It's the agent's job to know exactly who all of the important people in publishing are, and if they're a good agent, they have contacts with all these people. But publishers always at the beginning say no, no, no. So it's the agent's job to change that no, no, no to being yes, yes, yes. We love this proposal and we want to publish this book and we want that author to join us. And now comes the moment of the ecstasy where the agent calls and says, yes, I've sold your book to the publisher and we're so happy because it's one of the greatest moments of our lives and it's followed by the agony of saying oh gosh now I actually have to write the darn thing <laughs> and whatever process you want to use to write the book in my experience it always takes one year I've done four of these now it always takes a year to write the book and then you finish your manuscript we turn it into the publisher and they're going to publish the book which now is another nine-month process. Now keep in mind, all of this is changing with self-publishing. 
I'm still looking at the old model for us right now. It's nine months, and here's the people we're going to meet in this process. That's us, the author. We're going to have an editor. The publisher provides a sales team. They provide a copy editor. There's going to be a cover designer. There will be a book designer. There will be a typesetter. There will be other authors. There's going to be a public relations team. And then in the end, finally, we're going to get to the audience, the actual book lovers. And here's the way it works. Super duper quick. We've turned in our manuscript. There it is, the author's manuscript. We give it to the editor, and through a little bit of back and forth over a one-month period, we finally polish it till it's perfect. Then month two, that editor presents it to the sales team, the copy editor, the editor, back to the author. Month three, the jacket art gets designed, the interior of the book gets designed, and the copy editor goes through the first pass, sends it back to the author. Lots of back and forth, making sure that every, every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Month four, catalogs get made and sold out, sent out to booksellers. Book interiors produced, the galleys, the initial printed version are made. That gets proofed again. Then something called a blue line gets made, which is a final proof. Galleys sent past to other authors who might want to blurb it. The PR team takes those blurbs, takes the galleys, starts to send it off to people that might be interested. The jackets get printed, the books get printed, the books get put in boxes, and then they get shipped and distributed all over the world, and they finally appear on bookshelves in the real world and in bookshelves in the virtual world. And that whole process does take about nine months to do. Now, it is accelerating as systems are getting faster. It shouldn't take anywhere near that long. With self-publishing, that whole thing can take place in about three months. The downside of self-publishing is this part right here. Self-publishing, you lack the ability to sell and distribute in an effective way, although that's changing too. But the real reason traditional publishers still have something great is they have production capacity, they have sales and distribution channels that most of us mere mortals do not. And that's why I've elected to continue to work with traditional publishers. In the end, it's all worth it, though, because as the author, when we finally get a copy of that book in our hand, we jump right over the moon. Homework uh, will be this, my own presenter's journey. What I want you to do is think about the next presentation that you need to make, whether that's a presentation at work, uh, matter whether, whether you're like uh, James B. who's with us and you've got to give a wedding toast or you need to do a welcome ceremony or what have you. What I want you to do is make a very quick visual equation of the central idea of your talk and then I want you to draw a portrait of you talking and your audience responding. Hey, thank you all for another great lesson. This is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy, but don't go away. Now on our new platform, you can still submit your homework. Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you, do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the Images window, click on Upload, and then click on Add Files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in pictures, and I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click Upload. After the upload is complete, click Close. Then scroll down. And you'll see that the last image is here, and it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click Insert. I suggest in the Dimensions box you change the maximum to 1,200 pixels and leave the Constrained Proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step. The most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.